Dr. Yoshi Ram is a local integrative medicine physician with extensive experience and training in neuroscience. In this conversation, we discuss practical questions around when to incorporate microbiome testing and recommendations in practice, what to recommend, and with whom to co-manage when necessary. We discuss other topics like simple screening tools and questions to determine when the gut may be influencing the body and brain. We explored the bi-directional relationship between the gut and brain. We talked about when to look at the gut, whether you come from a mental health paradigm, a structural health paradigm, or a biochemical health paradigm. Lastly, we even explored the pitfalls of diet recommendations, his personal favorite, and the difference between referring to a dietitian versus a nutritionist versus a functional medicine doctor. Whether you've been looking at the microbiome and diet for years, or you're wondering how this can help your own clients' outcomes, this talk is sure to be filled with gems. Hi, Dr. Ram. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to uh, talk with me here. So let's get started. We're going to be talking about the microbiome. We're going to be talking about the gut-brain connection, the two-way street. And um, we're going to start diving deeper into why different practitioners may want to know about this. So um, uh, first of all, how would you like to get started on this? Well, sounds good. Thank you for having me. And uh, first of all, I just hope that this really serves the community of listeners that you have. And you know, gut. Um, there's so much being made nowadays about the gut and the microbiome. Um, I, I think we're realizing more and even closer into the mainstream medicine side of things uh, how important the gut health is. And what's not being talked about is this brain gut connection as opposed to the gut brain connection and so i think we'll dive in a little bit on both aspects maybe give a little bit more background on the gut just for those who aren't up to speed but you know i think hippocrates was a very wise individual and he said that 90 percent of disease begins in the gut and i think that's so true wow. um, it's certainly uh, certainly upheld that principle is certainly upheld in my practice at least and so uh, do you want me to keep going on that oh, I think that's Brian? fantastic yeah I mean let's let's jump in I, it, it's funny I was just interviewing uh, Naveen Jain who just uh, who is the founder of Viome oh something nice. you chatted about and he he quoted the same quote and yeah. it's like a lot of uh, doctors are really kind of revisiting that. And we're, we're, as we go upstream, we're seeing so many things are um, starting out in the gut. So, um, but yeah, so let's explore it. This, this whole bi-directional gut-brain relationship here. Um, why, why would different practitioners even care? Because it's all connected, right? Yeah. Let's our, jump into that. What, every, what you, everything is connected. Our... I, so I'm going to go back to the gut there, right? 90% of the, of the life forms in our gut, um, or I should say 90% of all the cells in our body are actually in our gut. In other words, they're not part of our body, but they're outside of our body or in the intestinal tract. And so if you think of 90% of us is basically a pile of shit, <laughs> and 90% of us is is this other entity. And so we are really, I think it's kind of a symbiotic uh, relationship and we are the lesser of us, right. okay, what we think of us. And, you know, in the gut, it's, it's estimated somewhere between 70 and 90% of our immune system is made in the gut. So if you're looking at somebody with some immune system issue, hey, voila, we got to look at the gut. It's estimated that somewhere in the two thirds to maybe 75, even 80% of all the neurotransmitters in the body are actually produced in the gut. And so when I, when, when I think of neurotransmitters, I think of anxiety, depression, um, fatigue, right? The list goes on and on of neurological conditions. And I think most people in the US have some level of anxiety or stress. Maybe it's not a diagnosed anxiety or depression, but hey, our, our mood is important and most people's mood is not well the majority of the time. And so this really does apply to almost everybody. I think whether you're, 
whether you're a, um, an MD or a DO or a chiropractor, or a massage therapist, there's something here for everyone. Yeah, no, it, it's fascinating. Um, we had a, another speaker uh, speak at, at our last uh, conference, and he was talking about the role of the, the microbiome in keeping our tight junctions um, tight in our epithelial cells, which basically means our, our digestive system and our um, cardiovascular system. And so he was, he was uh, talking about performance athletes for some of our structural specialists. Um, he, you know, he was saying that our connective tissue gets um, desiccated and dries out if we have, uh, if we don't have tight junctions and we have things like leaky gut, leaky veins, uh, and that our microbiome actually influence even our ability for our connective tissue to be strong, right? So like a, a, pro, a pro athlete that wants to stop spraining their ankle all the time, you wouldn't think that they need to maybe look at their gut as well as, as playing a role in there. So it's interesting how this is playing out. Now, specifically though, um, let's, let's go to the brain because I, gosh, I love, I, I, this has been an amazing uh, um, rabbit hole for me because we keep exploring how many things are connected to the gut. But if we kind of just focus in on the brain, what, what are we understanding about um, the role of the gut and the brain together? Well, I, I would say one aspect is there's um, this myenteric plexus, and this is a, this is kind of a, if you took the intestine, there's different layers of it, and in the middle of that layer of intestinal wall is the myenteric plexus, and, you know, I believe 30% of it, around 30% of it is sensing what's going on in the gut, and then sending it again this is a nervous system in and of itself kind of the, the second brain the gut as a second brain so it's sensing what's going on in the gut and then making neurotransmitters but 70 percent of that is is also input from the brain so the brain is controlling the myenteric plexus or controlling the gut mm. and so in some well how shall i roll into this but so stress, so you can see how stress, whether it's an acute stress or chronic stress, um, can really roll in straight to affecting the gut, uh, directly the gut. Um, much less when you're talking about your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems or that autonomic nervous system balancing out. And the, for those of you who may not know or may not remember, right, the, the parasympathetic is kind of that rest and digest. The sympathetic system is more that stress, that fight or flight response. And so if, and the sympathetic nervous system basically it goes down the spinal column and, and exits from the vertebrae. Mm -hmm. um, to affect the rest of our body, whereas the parasympathetic system really mainly comes down the vagus nerve, exits from the skull, and travels down the neck, but outside of the vertebral column, and, if, and, and then innervates you know, most of our organs, and, including the gut, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Can we explore the vagus a little bit? Let's, let's chat about the vagus, because... Uh... I think it's a fascinating thing with, uh, you know, we deal with a lot of concussions and, I, and, I, and the, it's, we're learning how people's gut are being immediately screwed up after a concussion and people yeah. are trying to understand why. And, uh, and also we're seeing how so many things from the gut are influencing the brain through that vagus nerve. Um, what, 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 what can we learn about that? Well, the, I mean, go a few different ways here. But one thing, just the, the uh, we'll talk about brainwave frequencies actually. And so there's different brainwave frequencies. Um, we start, you can start at the delta, there are the lower frequencies, which is typically more of a deep sleep. And then theta, where we move into the kind of a semi conscious, and then uh, alpha, and then beta, and then higher is the higher beta. And that's the stress response. Yeah. And so, hey, a thousand years ago, a couple thousand years ago, right? I'm in front of that that wild animal that I'm afraid of, right? I'm supposed to get this stress response. I'm supposed to go into the high beta frequencies. And I want my sympathetic nervous system to kick into gear. The problem is that after that experience is done, 
a, either we're, we've already been eaten and we no longer exist or else we've survived. After that experience is done, right, we're done. We're, we should switch back over to that parasympathetic mode, that calmer mode, more of the alpha or low beta state mode. And so you can see, and, and now the, the brain frequencies, they, they cover the whole brain, but especially the cortex. And, you know, the cortex, there, there's, you know, the brain is super complicated, obviously. And we're, learn we, we're really just scratching the surface. But this affects the balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the sympathetic, parasympathetic, it's not just a balance, but it's like it's really hard for the parasympathetic to be turned on if the sympathetic is turned on. Right? And so if we're stuck in that high beta, our, our parasympathetic can't operate well. Right. And so our gut can't operate well. Operate and I don't know if you want to go down the structural aspect right now, but there's a huge structural component, hmm. right? And well, let's, let's do this. If, if you're okay with it, because I'm so intrigued by this. It's something that I read about way too often <laughs> um, on my spare time. But so we have this, this you know, sympathetic and parasympathetic, and, uh, and they're both part of this, this, this autonomic nervous system. And really, when we start talking, I mean, when we're talking about anxiety, like which, which our group did in January, you know, we had Tina Payne Bryson talking about upregulation and downregulation and, and how, you know, and, and when we're dealing with resilience and how, how human beings can function, we're learning that we're, a lot of us are just kind of chronically upregulated. It seems like it's very common. Right. And so another word for that upregulation is what you're saying. We're, we're in this sympathetic tone where every, the, our whole nervous system is tuned to this fight or flight. And it's almost by definition, I know it's not mutually exclusive, but when that's on, it really turns off the, the parasympathetic. Yes, exactly. Right. And so for like, so here, I, like, so in my, when I co-manage some of my patients, um, I'm realizing that if, if my patient has chronic stress and they're just very anxious and they have, they, they have so many things going on in their homes and they're, they're, they're a, a single parent with multiple kids and that they're dealing with all the stress, um, I have to kind of take that into account and understand that there is a sympathetic overdrive. There's an upregulation happening here. And I have maybe three windows to look into how I can help that person, help influence that person, right? Either mentally uh, to do that psychologically, right? Or chemically try to find ways to help that person downregulate or structurally make some kind of change that's going to help them do that, right? So, but any practitioner, it, I, I think it would be useful for us to kind of look through that lens sometimes and say, what, what is, what, what's this, what system is dominant right now in this person's life? Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I love that. I love that system, that mirror, that window that you're looking at it from. Uh, because if someone has, you know, for MDs or DOs, usually somebody comes in and they, you know, irritable bowel disease, right? Right. Well, if they're totally stressed out all the time or nearly all the time because of life, right? That can be a big contributor. Um, we can do all of the uh, whether you want to go prescription drug therapies or whether you want to do herbal oral herbal therapies to try to rebalance the the microbiome out there we can do all of that but we're not addressing the 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 root cause right how did that stress affect that parasympathetic nervous system that vagus nerve which then affected the gut and made that gut literally more leaky or more gut permeability and ended up causing this gut microbiome dysregulation. Well, when you get that leaky gut, then little particles of those bacteria or protozoa literally go into the bloodstream or, uh, or just undigested food goes into the bloodstream and then your body makes these antibodies against it um, or just creates a, an immune response or an inflammatory response. And so whether you're going more of the gut and psychology syndrome and, and going with a brain diagnosis from depression, anxiety, you know, we could be talking about multiple sclerosis or ALS or chronic fatigue syndrome, or if you want to go towards more of a gut and physiology syndrome diagnosis, 
and that, you know, you were talking osteoarthritis, bone issues, ankle sprains, right? Because of this inflammation that is ultimately caused, right? Not ultimately, but you, if you kind of backtrack, you backtrack to that gut, um, that gut lining and the permeability and the, the, you track it back up that parasympathetic or that vagus nerve abnormality, which all started out from that stress, whether that, from that chronic life stress. Right. So if we, if we back up for a second, and this is where I, I, I love it. Um, okay. So we have this bi-directional highway between uh, the brain and the gut, right? And we're saying that let's say somebody comes into a practitioner um, like any of our functional medicine practitioners, right, uh, or, or naturopaths or the gastroenterologists, and they have something like leaky gut syndrome or they have irritable bowel syndrome, right? Um, what, you're, what I hear you saying is we need to also start to look at, well, what is the dominant reason for this person, for this person's condition? And is it coming from one of these three areas, right? Is it, is it coming from the stress in their life, which would be maybe the psychological lens? Um, is it coming from some chemical or food issue that this person is dealing with, which is the chemical lens? Or is this person, like in, the, for, in our instance, did they, this person have a head trauma that mm -hmm. created a, 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 um, a chronic inflammation and vagal uh, uh, um, stimulation to the gut that made it immediately shut down, become leaky, and become dysfunctional from that end, right? So it almost seems like, and each person may have different combinations of, of the dominant uh, uh, issue. Is that, is that right? Exactly correct. I mean, it might be from the structural aspect, it could have been just a, a traumatic injury. Um, that's an instantaneous, that's a structural issue, right? If they had if they had a if they're pretty happy in general right there's not that psychological component if they've got a pretty good diet and they weren't having a gut issue before right that's probably not the majority of it or maybe they were pretty good on the diet but not as good and there's kind of like a 20 percent diet maybe they're you know living the american dream but they're really not totally happy so there's another 20 percent psychological but then, bam, here comes this injury that creates this structural disconnect, and maybe that's the other 60%. So which, which one of those are you going to address first? Right. If they come into me, I'm going to send them out to someone who's working more on that manual therapy side of things, working on their structure of their body. Mm -hmm. If they're... If, if it were reversed and it was, no, I'm stressed out as heck, well, hey, we got to have a real conversation from the psychogenic, psychological aspect. Um, and maybe that's something I can help out with. Maybe that's enough. Maybe I can refer them to a book or to whatever, a class, or maybe I refer them to another healthcare professional. So absolutely, I love the way you look at that. That's a beautiful way. And a, and a nice way to be able to um, define what the best course of action is mm. because we the reality is we can all help these people they walk in our door we can all help some aspect of it but how effective is our therapy gonna be right we don't all do everything we can't all do everything for every patient and so it, it's a beautiful way to look at it I love it yeah yeah so no I, and it, it seems to be helpful and, and you know so we're trying to jump into these practical scenarios where a practitioner can listen to this and say, okay, well, what am I going to get out of this um, over the next, you know, 60 minutes? And, and so I think that uh, understanding this connection between the brain and the gut is, is huge. Um, also, like, like we're saying, that, that looking at it, that it could be one of three areas, sometimes two out of the three, sometimes all three have to be addressed, um, but seeing which ones are dominant, which ones are majors, which ones are minors. Um, but now from the same thing, we can look at the brain and if we're dealing with anxiety and depression, we're, we're trying to deal with um, post-concussive changes, our neuropsychologists who work with, with um, mapping the brain and, and um, you know, people that are doing like, like QEGs and so on. Um, we're also saying, hey, let's, let's, put, let's use that same formula looking at the brain and its connection to the gut as well, right? Is it, is it starting mostly from the gut and going up to the brain and influencing that? 
is are there uh, uh, psychological lenses we need to look through? Are there chemical lenses we need to look through? Are there are there structural lenses we need to look through? How does somebody navigate that? Like, um, let let's just use another example. I mean, let's uh, we, we talked about anxiety how uh, in January. How would we look at that if somebody came to a, a mental health professional, and the mental health professional wants to start to look at the gut and and how, where do they begin? What do they do? <laughs> Um, ask them how their poop is. <laughs> ask them how they feel about the food they eat. Is is this? I mean, you got it. You have to take a proper history. That's that's always the first thing to do outside of looking at the patient. You know, you got to take a proper history. And so, just the simple questions of, hey, what food are you eating? Mm -hmm. Is that a nutrient dense food? Is it a real food? Mm -hmm. Right. And we, that's a whole nother discussion on what that, what food actually is. Uh, I'm happy to go down that route if you want to go down that route. But hey, what food, what, what are you putting into your mouth? What fuel are you putting into your mouth? What hydration are you putting into your mouth? Um, how's your poop? <laughs> wow. Consistency, frequency. I mean, that's going to tell you right there, do you have any abdominal pain, right? Th those couple of questions right there are going to tell you, hey, something's up with the gut or not. Interesting. So if, if the gut is big enough, if, if it can play a big enough role with any type of mental health practitioner and, and some of the people that come through their doors, um, what you're saying is even just like three or four questions on an intake, may already begin to shed some light on whether or not there's this ascending relationship from the gut to the brain, right? Like that's helpful. That's, that's practical. That's a practical thing we can do tomorrow, right? We can retype out our, our intake and say, I'm going to look at the gut, to, uh, you know, three questions on everybody that comes to the door over the next three months. Yeah. Right? And exactly. see what's going on. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if someone, someone could have been fine and then needed a course of antibiotics, and then suddenly they develop the, the, these issues, these, these gut issues, mm -hmm. right? um, then you know that we got to do a lot of the treatment aspect has got to be towards healing the gut. Mm. So, but I love it. You're totally right. I mean, it's a couple, it's a three questions. And then we know it gives us a guideline on where to direct. Yeah. So how's the food and water you're take intaking? How's your poop? And maybe uh, have you been exposed to a lot of antibiotics recently? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there, there's, you know, with the, with the gut microbiome, we're on generations of horrendous and worsening gut microbiomes from C-sections and lack of breastfeeding and antibiotics, which are prescribed in my opinion, probably 90, 95% of the time they should not be prescribed. So they're way over prescribed. Um, are they a great thing? Absolutely. They can be life saving. Absolutely. There's no question about that. But they're over prescribed for common colds that, that really need a much better and different sort of treatment. Oral contraceptive pills, right? There's 80,000 toxins in our environment that we're exposed to that humans weren't even, you know, 200 years ago, we were exposed to only a few hundred, if, you know, so toxins is another aspect, but you don't have to get too into all of that right away. It, it really can begin with just three, four or five questions. I see. Right. And that, that way, that's something we can do tomorrow, right? So tomorrow, maybe we don't go all into the, the, the deep history, but if there's some big, obvious things that are showing up from those three questions, then it just gives us an idea of, well, there may be something happening here, yep. right? And yeah. it's something to look at, right? So if, if, we, if we continue down that road, I'm kind of curious. So let, let's, let's put ourselves in, and neither of us are mental health uh, 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 professionals, but let's, let's do this because hopefully, you know, it, it would help them identify, you know, when to look at this. Okay, so we're putting three questions in our questionnaire. And then we are in the consult. What else are we looking for where it can possibly suggest that there is a gut brain relationship? Um, so there's uh, is is their gut having some influence over the feelings and the and the, the issues that they're dealing with in that in that period? What would we ask? What what, what would we say or ask to go deeper? Um, deeper than those initial questions. Those initial. 
Yeah, because then we want to explore, right? If that's our screening, then, you know, in the conversation, um, what, what would I want to know to like, oh, gosh, I don't deal with the gut. Maybe I should look at the gut. Like, is this gut even playing a role? Um, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, a few things I can think of. Hey, so the microbiome starts, the gut starts at the mouth and it ends at the anus. And so how's the dental, how's the oral health? Mm. And that goes from breath to, to teeth. I mean, you can obviously sometimes just look at somebody during the course of talking. You don't even have to ask them and you can see their um, oral, how their oral health is. Acid reflux. I mean, that's a, that's a very simple question. So many people have acid reflux. Yeah. People should never have acid reflux. It is not normal to have acid reflux. So many, I get so many people, oh, I have acid reflux. Oh, when you have, uh, you know, just a couple nights a week. Well, that's, I mean, if they have it a couple nights a week, their gut is not healthy. So I think acid reflux is so common. That would be a really nice screening. Another nice screening question. Um, just abdominal pain, abdominal discomfort, and gas. Mm. I would put those at a couple if you want to go a little bit further. Um, again, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have smelly gas. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. You want to so, keep going with that, or so no, so that's helpful. And so then, um, and now again, as a, as a mental health practitioner, we may be thinking, well, why are we asking these questions again? How is this going to change what I'm doing? So if the gut, if the, the, the microbiome in our gut is um, responsible for triggering the production of 90% of the serotonin in our body, a huge percent of the dopamine in our body, um, you know, we're seeing that uh, it can be a huge source of neuroinflammation, which seems to have a tremendous role in brain function, in um, creating, you know, hyperstimulating the amygdala, which is our, again, that fight or flight um, reactive uh, state. It, you know, if, if, if we're assuming that, that these health, mental health practitioners are, are aware of this, then the, the, the second step is, well, what can I do to screen for this to begin to look at, it, right? That's what we're, just, we're saying. And now we're saying, okay, well, let's dive a little bit deeper with, from a few questions to get a better understanding. Now what? Let, let's take this to the last step and we say either it's going to go one of two ways. Either I'm going to then give this some advice about the gut as a mental health practitioner, which I may say, hey, that's, I, I don't have the time or energy to want to deal with this. Some are, they're a lot more holistic and integrative and they want to begin to look at that. So that's perfect. But what if, so what are a few basic tips that the mental health practitioner can do to maybe give some rough recommendations? Um, and where, who would they then maybe co-manage with if it's something that seems like it's more involved? I mean, one thing, if they're comfortable with it, they can always order a, and they want to go down the lab testing route. You can actually test the stool, um, either Genova Diagnostics, Great Plains Laboratory. Um, Viome is something they can simply, so Viome's a newer test. That's, I think you mentioned Naveen Jain, right? He's, I, I don't know what his position, he's head of Viome basically though. Yeah, and um, Viome is something where the, pa the client or the patient can go online and order themselves that and and that basically gives them a detailed uh, look at their stool and gives them dietary guidelines to follow and so it's a very easy thing hey go check out viome do the test you don't even have to be part of that um, discussion on giving your own recommendations so that would be frankly if you're not going to refer out to another practitioner to do that either a new uh, good holistic nutritionist or a holistic dietitian or, or, or a naturopath, whoever else you're going to consider. I, I love Viome. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's, it's a newer thing. It hasn't been around that long, but the few people I've seen do it, um, they have claimed positive results from them. And I haven't had anybody who didn't get some health benefit, self-reported health benefit. So I love Viome as an idea. Cool. Um, yeah. Food sensitivity testing that's another route you can go um, I'm a little bit hesitant on that in the initial stages because if there is gut permeability you're gonna come back with a whole hell of a lot of list of food sensitivities and then that just frustrates people more so I'd rather do a little bit of gut healing first 
And then later on, you do some food sensitivity testing um, to figure out those just uh, maybe a couple of high yield foods to avoid. But that's an individualized thing. Um, yeah. I totally did not answer your question. What was your question? No, no, you're answering it really well. I mean, again, you know, my, my line of thinking in this is if I'm, if I'm a mental health practitioner and now I find that the gut seems to have, it seems to be playing a role in this person's possible mental health or, or at least just, you know, brain health, then I'm either going to have to do something on my own, like a, like a half step, something easy. I'm not going to become a gut expert, but maybe I can direct them to a book, to a, a biome, like per se, something that that's, that's their self-managed. And, and then if, if they come back and they're happy and it seems to help and, and improve my outcomes, then, I, then it ends there, right? But if, it, if they still have deeper gut issues that biome or the book or something else doesn't solve, then yeah, ideally we'd want to co-manage them with someone other, right? And that's where, so I, I love your examples of, you know, doing some of the, some of some basic testing or then who, who else would you, would you refer? Like you, 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 you brought up a few people, right? Like um, functional medicine an, a, a natural bat path, um, new, clinical nutritionist, like what, what, who, who's out there that we could co-manage with? Um. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to refer to myself, but like there's a Tracy, our holistic health coach, like she's wonderful in, in our office. She's wonderful at this. There, I, I mean, if you go online and look at integrative um, nutritionist, that's going to be a good place to start in general. Natu almost any naturopathic doctor is going to know their stuff. Um, I don't want to leave anybody else out. I'm sure there's so many people who are really into this gut thing. Um, it's a tricky one thing I, I do just want to comment um, diets. I, you know, everybody's got their own idea of what the best diet is. And um, that's, that's, I'm just going to mention that. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's one diet right for everyone. Um, so beware of any person who puts everybody on one diet. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say stay away from that. That's not the proper way to treat anybody. There are some general dietary guidelines that are absolutely wonderful to follow. And if they consist of eat real food, well, I, that's a dietary guideline I can get behind. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that is very helpful. Thank you for that. And, and so, you know, and this, I mean, this is something that comes up in our own office. Like, you know, we don't manage diet. We don't manage um, any type of, of chemical balancing in the body, we, we, co we co-manage and work with so many other people that are great at it, right? I don't need to do it. So, but I do need to decide who I'm going to send them to, right? And it seems to be also catered to who is this person and what are their needs and wants and desires. And it, I kind of feel like it, we're in a bit of a wild west right now where there are so many different types of people out there doing all these good things, but I don't have a way to organize that information so I can make them a, a better educated match, right? Between the client or patient I have in my office today and the person that's going to be hopefully the best use of that patient's time and money. Yeah. Right. So, so if I want to just ask you, and again, I, you know, we can go in a few different directions with this, but I mean, we're talking about naturopaths and we're, and I've mentioned functional medicine doctors. And so between the two, like both of those, uh, those encompass, you know, uh, doctors who have a certain amount of training in systems and in um, the role of food and medicine uh, and herbs in, in, in as a treatment for disease. Would that be fair enough to say? Yes. Okay. So there's a higher level of education and training, and but there's also this idea that they're looking at things. Um, that you're not just looking at a medication to match a symptom. Is that right? Okay. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. Now, how do you contrast that with like? How come I shouldn't send somebody to their gastroenterologist? Because right? there's no functional medicine gastroenterologist. Right. There so, are a couple, but well, what is a gas? So that this is. I mean, this is. These are very real questions, right? Like, so mm. why wouldn't I send someone to a gastroenterologist, or when should I? Right. Like. Yeah. Like, yeah, good, good, good question. Uh, if someone has blood in their stool and it's not from just external hemorrhoids, send them to a gastroenterologist. If somebody's okay. coughing up blood, send them to a gastroenterologist. 
gastroenterologists are good for doing EGDs, endo endoscopies, where they do the camera down the, the mouth. Uh, okay. and, and they're good for doing colonoscopies, where they do the camera up the butt. Mm -hmm. And to basically to, to detect cancer or ulcers or whatnot. Um, outside of that, your typical Western medicine trained GI doctor, gastroenterologist, is really going to prescribe um, uh, an antacid, some form of an antacid. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some medication for irritable bowel syndrome that's going to cover up the symptoms. So they're, they're much more into treating symptoms. Outside of diagnosing cancer, which we want to diagnose cancer if that's, if, that's a, if that's a possibility, or at least rule it out. But in terms of, from my experience, in terms of asking for really good basic health, uh, nutritional health advice, um, I, I would never recommend any GI doctor. They're just not the right person for that situation. Okay, that, that's helpful. Really, that's helpful for me to know as well. So, so I'm not, I, I, sh I won't be surprised if the gastroenterologist has not, is not even looking at the microbiome. Absolutely. Or not. isn't looking at how food may be influencing this one way or the other. Not or, this day and age. Maybe day three age. years from now, uh, right. you know, functional medicine is making a headway. Um, okay. Three years from now, this could be a slightly different conversation, but today, absolutely not. So, right. right. So, so really what they're going to be doing is looking at the actual terrain of the gut and making sure that there's no tumors or ulcers or things that are, that have physically damaged the gut in some way. And and, th and if there is some, they're either going to refer, refer that person to an oncologist for the cancer, um, a, some kind of surgeon to cut something, or again, some type of medication to, to, to suppress the symptoms. Is that yeah, right? That, that's a great generalization. Absolutely. And I hope I'm not, I'm not you know, prematurely you know, limiting what they're doing. So we want to learn more. So if someone knows of, of other things that are being done, please share that in the comments or... or, or uh, uh, help uh, inform us better. Um, but it, it, that's helpful for me to know then who do I refer to, right? Now, there are also dietitians, right? And it seems like there's not just one type of dietitian. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so do, do you, are you f more familiar with who would like, I, I know there are already two like national organizations of dietitians. Yeah. Yeah, there's you can in so there's dietitians and nutritionists and then health coaches. There's okay, kind of so there's three categories. Okay, and, and I would say those three can tend to really they're usually usually with health coaches their main thing is diet as well. Um, some might specialize have other specialties, but most of them are dietary. So all of these all three categories of people are generally going to be looking at your food. Mm. And dietitians tend to be more precise. Now, these are generalizations, so yes. I don't want to put everybody in the same bucket in this. Not like I did with GI doctors, where you can, that's a pretty cut and dry at this point in the game. But right nowadays, dietitians tend to be more precise. So if you have somebody who really, you feel a certain number of calories is necessary um, of an exact type of nutrient, um, so they're going to generally be looking more at blood work or maybe working with blood work in, in conjunction with a physician um, just to be more precise mm -hmm. versus nutritionists are going to be able uh, nutritionists and a lot of health coaches are going to be able to give that just kind of everyday general advice that tends to be really good if they're functionally medicine trained or, is, or some realm a similar, similarly trained, and there's a lot of different certifications out there, a, mm -hmm. a lot. And I have found that some with the most certifications really kind of simply suck and still give, you know, typical dietary, American dietary, um, diabetic association. I mean, if someone's following the like standard American diabetic association diet plan or the standard American cardiologist dietary plan, uh, they're not a good person. They're, they don't know about food. They don't, they don't really keep the Hippocratic Oath or the idea that food is medicine in mind. Wow, that's a strong statement. 
It is. I know. I hope I didn't offend anybody, but if I did, that's okay too. No, that's okay. Well, I, I, I mean, let's, let's explore that for a quick second and then we can continue to move on. I mean, obviously um, there's, uh, so why would, if we're talking about the gut and we're talking about that it can have an influence over the brain. And if, if that brain is, is having a chemical aspect that as a mental health practitioner, if we're continuing along this line, um, it's playing a role in my ability to help this person overcome the challenges they need if it's not just purely relationship-based, if it's not just because of some trauma they had as a child, but there's a, 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 a very real measurable amount of influence, whether it's inflammatory or changes to their, their uh, um, neurotransmitters. There's a chemical re reason that's, that's, that's amplifying their problem. Then if I'm going to find a solution, I need to know who to go to for the appropriate solution, right? And so um, why, why won't the American Heart Association or American Diabetic Association why wouldn't their recommended um, advice be appropriate to help? It comes them? down to sponsorship, right? Who's funding them? I mean, that's that's the majority of okay. So, and, and, just, and what we we've thought for a long time as a society in general, right? You go through the seventies where a couple of studies are commissioned and they decide some random people decides fat is bad right and then that becomes mainstream and so it's it's almost never out of ill intention that i find people give bad dietary advice it's it's really just ignorance and following the past rather than learning and and moving forward and, okay. and now, learning the most up to date and scientific literature Right. Well, so, so one person just structured it this way, which I thought was useful. And what they were saying was that um, some of these major national organizations, they still really subscribe to a macro nutrient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's this idea of all of your nutrition basically goes down to, you know, how much fat versus carbs versus protein are you taking? Right. And do you have just enough of the nu other nutrients to not become severely deficient in that nutrient? Right. Like do you 100 percent of your vitamin C means that if you had any less than that, you're at risk for scurvy, which is yeah. the, 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 the disease you get from deficiency of vitamin C. Exactly. Right. So um, it, and so this person that, that described it this way was it was helpful for me to understand because I realized, oh, if that's the paradigm they're using, then. I can understand why they would not, they're not even looking at the fact that food has influences our microbiome and has micronutrient considerations and influences and there's toxicity challenges that, that occur. And so they're not looked to, they're, if someone is trained in that field, they may not, they may have just closed their eyes to all these other things that seem now, there's a lot of uh, scientific literature, to show that those micronutrients are important, right? Yeah, that was beautifully put. I would agree with all of that okay. 100%. That was wonderfully put. Okay, so, but we, so you would agree? That's, Absolutely. Okay, then that's, help, then that's helpful then, I think, also for our, our, our practitioners to say, okay, well, um, if, if, if I'm sending this person to a dietitian who's trained in some of these more conventional ways of macronutrients, that could be a question I can ask them, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's healthy for you? Yes, I never thought of it that way. That's great. I love it. Thank okay, you. Okay, cool. See, this is great. This, this is a creative yeah. process as well for yeah. us, right? So for, yeah. you know, these, these things pop up through collaboration and communication. Exactly. So, yeah, so, so if, if we're asking them, like, gosh, are you, um, you know, it, what's healthy for you? And they're saying, well, it's a, it's a certain amount of protein in the day and a certain amount of carbohydrates in the day and a certain amount of, of fat in the day. And you get that right, they're, they're going to be pretty good. You may just know that that person may not be the, 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 the guide to help your client fix their microbiome, right? They're not even like that. Okay. And then, but we're also saying that there's, there's this whole other, all these other groups and coaches, right? Anybody can become a coach after a weekend seminar, right? Absolutely. There's yes. a lot of people also on the other end that are like, yeah, you got to get your microbiome balanced and you got to be able to, you know, make sure you're, you're, you're detoxifying and all these things. But they may also <laughs> not really know the depth of what's needed to give any real good counsel as well. Yeah. Yes. It's a challenge, right? It is. 
It's a huge challenge. Right. But at least we can begin to navigate into some kind of generalities that can help us at least start to ask some better questions. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> uh, but so, but it, chances are if somebody is a dietitian or nutritionist and they're working with like, say you, um, they're working with another naturopath or another MD and they're, they've already proven themselves to not just be macro nutrient focused. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to me kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah, they're going to definitely be able to head someone in the right direction. Okay. That's yeah. Cool. That's cool. Um, uh, all right. I love it. I love it. So, so that, so we can either send them on, you know, do something on your own, read this book. Um, is, are there any good books? Um, I will tell you my personal favorite diet since you asked. Yeah. I wasn't going to get into this, but um, my personal favorite diet is actually something called Wild Fit. I've Wild Fit? Heard of this. No, I haven't even heard of it. It's, um, and I tell you why I like it is because it's not a diet. It, it, it's a 90 day program. You can go to getwildfit.com. Um, or I have a link on my website, dryoshi.com and then you go to store and it's just a link, um, as a resource for people Great. Um, to check it out. But wild fit, I love it. It's a 90 day program. It's not, they don't just start out and, you know, cut out this, this and this, right. It's not, it's not cut out these four infl inflammatory foods. It's not do this or do that or do, you know, butter in your coffee, which I don't have any problem with, but it's not a diet. It deals a lot more with the emotional connection to how we make our food choices. And if we're going back to gut brain, oh my God, how many of us make emotionally based, emotionally charged food decisions? Oh, interesting. I mean, I can tell you, I'm a pretty fit guy overall and I eat very healthy by most people's standards. But if I, if I am stressed, even if I have my so-called healthy snack, if I'm sitting in front of the computer and I'm stressed, I'm trying to hit a deadline, man, I guarantee you that whole bag of nuts is going to go down my hatch within about five minutes. Right. That's not healthy. Like, even though it's a healthy food, it's not a healthy um, situation. And so our thoughts, and, and I have yet to meet somebody who starts a diet and then continues it until the day they die. Right. Okay. Assuming it wasn't a sh very short life expectancy. <laughs> so diets are temporary, right? And so I love something that can get at the emotional and psychological aspect of us making our food choices. And so Wild Fit does that. And then they really, I mean, paleo is probably the principal underlying pr principle, but then they also take you through a cyclical seasonal eating pattern which I think is really nice as well. I don't think, you know, the way the human body is designed, whether you believe we uh, evolved from apes or were put here by God, it, the, the way the human body is designed is to go through some sort of season. Now, the season varies depending on where in the world you are and where you originated, but we are yeah, not I've actually those things. We don't always, have it in LA, but I, I've heard yeah. that. that <laughs> yeah. <helps. laughs> we, we, and that, you know, this goes down another route at whole, but we're not actually meant to have the same poop all year, day in, day out, all year round, right? Because the foods change. We put some new food, some new food comes into season, suddenly that root vegetable is ready to eat. We pull it out of the ground, we eat it. Oh, we have a little bit of gas in our poop changes the next day right that's a good healthy poop change and so right. i love the wild fit program i think it's i think it's masterfully done is it perfect absolutely not but it's the best long-term healthy diet solution i have yet to see yeah. so yeah. plug for that's that great. that's really great um i love that well let's uh, if you're okay with it let's let's uh change gears a little bit let's talk about the structure and um understanding you know how this gut brain relationship we can we can go one of two ways we can either talk about how the brain is influencing the gut um whether like a chemical uh in a chemical way or a structural way or even just for people that are dealing like our physical therapist colleagues uh, chiropractors the osteopaths the physical trainers um how how is understanding the role of the gut important in the things that we're doing like either avoiding injury or improving performance would you what would you say to that I mean, when we're talking about structure, yeah, there's kind of the, uh, you could go either, either way. Um, 
if someone's structure is off, it's going to affect their organs in some manner. Uh, that's just the way the body, again, the way the body is designed. Um, we're not made to be totally symmetrical, but we are made to move and have pain-free movement. That is how our body should be. And so if, you're, if you just look at someone walking in the door at you and they're a little bit hunched over or, you know, they're walking a little bit tilted to one side or they're obviously walking in pain, their gait is abnormal, right? You, you know there's something, there's some structural issue. And the viscerosomatic, somatovisceral connection between whatever level of the body that, that um, issue is, that physical issue is at, is going to be connected to the spinal cord at some level and thus connected back to the associated at kind of the same level that, um, that organ or tissue. Um, so it really is, it's, it's definitely true that whether you're a physical therapist or a massage therapist or acupuncturist or an osteopath or a chiropractor or whatever, it, um, this, this is a real issue. And, you know, certain um, structural dissymmetries at, at certain places in the body are going to affect the gut. Some are not as nearly as much. I mean, if someone is pretty healthy and they go sprain their ankle, you know, that's probably not going to be really affect their gut. Right. Well, so for example, I mean, we'll, we'll bring in like, um, you know, we have a few physical therapist uh, colleagues, well, quite a few. And, you know, they've brought up, you know, like fascia. Yeah. Fascia is this wonderful network of connected tissue throughout the body. And when somebody has, you know, an injury to some part of their body, mm -hmm. uh, it can create a lot of fascial, what they call adhesions. Mm -hmm. And those adhesions can actually mechanically begin mm -hmm. to affect some of the digestive movement in the area, right? Or yeah. like, or post, um, you know, we post operatively post -operative, like C-sections and, and yeah. post appendectomy. Like I had, I had an a, a, a appendicitis when I was a kid and I'm still having um, body workers and physical therapists looking into the, how the, that surgery back when I was, I think eight is still influencing my own digestion. Yeah. Right? Because, yes. because there's a certain part of my intestine that's literally kind of like stuck into the fascia after the surgery and it healed as a big scar. Yeah, right? and I would say after almost any scar, any surgery anywhere in the abdominal area, people are gonna have that issue. Wow. That's a great point, I love that you brought that up. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, my example of the, the sprained ankle, when I said that, that was more thinking of an acutely sprained ankle, mm -hmm. but a chronically sprained ankle or that's causing chronic pain, then suddenly your knee shifts, your hips, and then, that, I mean, it just works its way up the body potentially. So right. absolutely, yeah. the, the yeah. fascial network is so underappreciated by your more mainstream medicine and is so vitally important to our structure. Yeah, so, yeah. And so it's interesting. We had, um, we had a patient who was having a lot of gut issues and, um, you know, we had, we had to co-manage the person, but like the motility, the movement of the gut, was really being affected. Like the, the like she just could not get movement through. Like it what the it, it wasn't the, the areas of the of the intestines were not moving in a way that was that was cyclical or or um, in a waveform to allow the for the movement of, of of the digestive material, right? And so what we saw was um, she and she actually had a head and neck injury a long time ago that seemed to have an influence over some of that motility through the vagus tone. And that was what we worked on. But um, she had all kinds of adhesions down around her from, from a C-section. And, and so we had to decide, well, first of all, are they both playing a role? Is it only one? Is it only the other? Is this mechanical even at all, right? And then um, what should be the sequence? Should we go first? Should, yeah. Or maybe the physical therapist go first, right? Yeah. Do we need yes. to do it together? Yes. Um, and so these are like real world considerations that we had to solve. And um, our thinking, and I, I still don't know if it was the best, but we said go with the physical therapist first and work out all of those adhesions from that C-section and see if that helps, right? So for us, it was based on she, you know, it, the physical therapy was covered by her insurance and we weren't going to be, 
right? And so it's like taking her own consider, you know, financial consideration to play. We said, all right, go do that. And they did, and it really helped. I mean, it helped at probably a good 40, 50%, right? But she said, no, there's still other things that are going on that I'm having an issue with. And so then we came in and we, and we started making changes and we saw another 40 to 50% improvement, which was great, right? And so here she is now, she's able to digest, she's able to process her, her overall inflammation is going down, which I'm sure has all kinds of back effects to the brain. But, um, you know, in this instance, like there was something affecting the gut that was probably contributing to a lot of chronic inflammation, but it was purely mechanical. Yeah. Right. And so um, to me, that's uh, just, again, it's, it's another fascinating aspect of, to it where maybe she could have eaten well for, usually those are the people too. They're like, I've been eating perfectly for the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. You know anything. there's something else. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so that's great. So in your office as well, are you guys taking that into account? Are you guys looking at uh, co-managing with uh, people that are looking at the structure? Oh, absolutely. It's so, I mean, one of, you know, one of my core recommendations when I really look at my, the, the few premises that I have, and that's movement, healthy movement. Yeah. It, I mean, movement is medicine. And so if you're not able to move, and that includes structure, so if you're not structurally sound, um, then you haven't found health. And so absolutely, it's a vital part of getting somebody on the right path. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really cool. I know that you guys do a lot of that, which is awesome. Um, now, what about reverse? If somebody has a gut issue, um, how could that influence their, are they more prone to injury? Or yeah. they, if somebody's trying to work on performance with a, a student athlete or a semi-pro or pro athlete. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I was just talking to um, a physical therapist yesterday, actually. And he know he has a physical therapist friend who's trainer for such and such NBA team. And he was talking about LeBron James when he was with the Miami heat and he lost the game six. And um, I guess he left the game at the end in the fourth quarter due to cramps and at that point, apparently he was a McDonald's boy, right? Uh, and it was that game that changed him into this complete health nut. And now he, you know, I don't, I'm not on Instagram or Snapchat, but I hear, and I've seen a couple pictures, um, you know, he's always posting his really healthy meals, his really healthy food. And so, and you look at the guy and his age and how many games he's played at the highest level of professional athletes. And it's phenomenal what he's able to do. And he himself attributes that to taking care of his body from a structural standpoint, but from a fuel standpoint, from a proper fuel standpoint. And so you got to assume, and again, I'm assuming here, but I'm assuming his gut from when he was a McDonald's boy in that game six umpteen years ago, um, was probably had a lot of permeability to it, a lot of intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And compared to now, I'm sure his gut is phenomenally better than it was. And so I use that as an example. Um, again, I just heard that yesterday, but I just think it really highlights, um, and, and that, that goes for everyone. Right. Yeah. I'm using him as an example, but that goes for everyone. So. Yeah, because he, he's he's an example of being kind of like at the top of this performance spectrum. But, you know, even a person who's, you know, again, in our office, we deal with chronic pain and chronic injury. And, you know, and, and you're like, why isn't this person healing? Right. Yeah. Why isn't this person getting better? Why, why is this person still re-injuring themselves over and over again? Um, and we're seeing, well, gosh, if we're not, if, if the gut, if the gut is creating chronic inflammation, yeah, you can put on all the right food down the hatch, right? But if you're not absorbing it properly, then there's a whole other level beyond that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Um, if we flip that, I, I'd like to explore a little bit um, with you know with head trauma. A lot of people have head trauma. I think more than than than, than we we think. Um, you know, it's one of the the six themes we're going to have this year. Uh, with our group. And so, you know, post-concussion or mild traumatic brain injury is big. Um, what we're finding out is that um, it, it really almost can instantly create gut permeability after a head trauma. 
Um, and people are trying to understand why that's happening and what's going on. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'd be curious to know if, if you have any insight or just kind of even some, um, just even something to look at, uh, like how, like what's, what's your thought on that? And, and um, you know, how could somebody, you know, it, it's not a question we ask. Right. I mean, it, we don't even think about this relationship of the gut brain, but the, the brain gets the head trauma. The brain may not have a lot of actual physical damage to it from the blunt impact. But for some reason, whether it's an inflammatory cascade or through the vagus nerve, it immediately shocks the gut and the gut becomes permeable. And now all of a sudden there's this influx of chronic inflammatory cycles that are happening um, that seems to me to be like huge right here's structure affecting the the, the function right huge and um, I think this is definitely I mean with the recent NFL and the kind of the, the hoopla and media attention coverage of head traumas from on football players and CTE and concussions and the movie concussion coming out. This is becoming a bigger, um, more, just more awareness around it. Right. Um, I don't, to my knowledge, the, the scientific literature is not caught up. So I, I don't, I don't personally know. I don't know. Maybe you do. I'd be interested if you do know of some really good literature on how concussions are affecting gut, but, Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the vagus nerve um, and then just the, the trauma. I mean, how, how to say this, you know, when somebody, when you look at a violent picture, I'm just talking a picture. So a picture of a gun, your immune system goes, uh, markers of the immune system change within seconds, mm -hmm. right? That's just me looking at a picture of a gun, which carries a negative emotional connotation. So right. Is it so far fetched that you get blasted in the head, your brain gets rattled, and there's something, some changes are made, some dramatic changes are made, um, even to the point where your vagus nerve would affect your gut? I, I mean, I think we, we talked about the bi directionality of that gut brain connection. So I don't think it's very far fetched at all to, to realize that. And, you know, not so much on the concussion side of things, but if you look at, there's a lot of research into the hippocampus, which is the, the area of the brain that's for mainly short-term memory. Um, and it's a really good marker because it's, well, it's highly studied because of dementia or Alzheimer's dementia, mild cognitive impairment. And so a lot of study has gone into hippocampus and they're finding things that is studies back this up that it's more gut per or not gut but the blood brain barrier so more permeable than other parts of the brain necessarily but things like exercise and making sure you're getting well oxygenated and meditation actually grow the hippocampus i mean just any one of these alone um, mediterranean diet is the diet that was studied in this um, omegas increase the size um, and with hippocampus size matters and so all of these things along with playing brain games as well as neurofeedback has actually been shown so all of those things actually increase the size of the hippocampus and brain function so actually improve memory um, so you combine those together and you get very large uh, results mm. very quickly too, within weeks. Mm. Um, so a little bit of a segue, but just shows how, how dramatically the brain can be improved by some lifestyle changes. And when you look at how sensitive the brain is to each one of those lifestyle and changes individually, again, no it's no wonder that when you get whacked upside the head real hard, it's going to have some true profound physiologic changes. Mm -hmm. And it probably depends, I, I don't know any literature on this, this is my opinion, but it probably depends on the, your resiliency, right? How resilient is your brain? How many, um, how, what, what is your baseline? What is your baseline food like? So how healthy, how many good healthy fats do you already have synthesized into the cell membranes of your neurons, right? Because 
I got to tell you, seed oils and canola oil that's in just about everything is the worst thing you can do for a brain neuron. I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's horrible. And so if you have, but if instead you're using things in your diet, the oils, the main oils are the avocados and the coconut oil and um, coconut oil to cook with and, and real um, fat from healthy animals if you're not vegan um, and, and getting the fatty fish, the omega-3s, the right omega-3s on board, you know, these are going to, that most of our cell membranes are made up of mostly fats, different kinds of fats and cholesterol. And so if you get that, if you come into a, a brain trauma or a concussion with a resilient, well-formed neuron cell, you're not going to get the same side effects mm -hmm. as the same exact hit. You know, Dr. Yoshi on a poor diet, is going to be way more affected by the same hit than Dr. Yoshi on a really resilient, wild fit type diet. Yeah. And um, so, you know, the, and there's heavy metals to be considered, right? Um, aluminum in our vaccinations, much less other sources. Um, there's mercury, there's lead. And so if somebody is coming into a, a hard hit to the head or, or a motor vehicle accident with these things on board, this is like this is the real like yeah somebody got hit hard and that caused these symptoms but why did that hit hurt them so bad or affect them so much right, right. that's a whole nother kind of level of the onion right so it can it's it, exactly right that's, it's, an onion. it's a rabbit hole it's an onion and it's it's fun to check into yeah. <laughs> for me i love it i love it um, what I what I love to do, if you're okay with this, as we close off, I love to end um, with a short discussion on um, dementia, um, knowing that it's such a hot topic. We're, we're uh, I don't think there's any practitioner in Pasadena who doesn't have a significant amount of baby boomer uh, clients or patients, um, and it's it seems like the the rate is skyrocketing. They call it type three diabetes um, in some circles. Um, and it seems like from what I've heard, the, if we're talking about the gut brain connection, and if we go back to how the gut can influence the brain with dementia, um, the, the two lines of, of discussion that I've heard are um, neuroinflammation, mm -hmm. which we keep talking about, seems to have a, can be a big, can stem from the leaky gut, as well as um, just poor nutrition. Right, and so you, you've already talked about the, the hippocampus and um, you know, how nutrition can really influence that. What, what can we say to our practitioners um, who you know, are either dealing with this directly or indirectly or for ourselves? You know, I mean, I know you and I have conversations all the time about the latest, coolest thing that we can do to help our brains get better, right? Yeah. Um, what, um, how, how, if, as we close off this conversation, what, what, what would you, um, like to talk about it regarding either one of the, either one or the other of those uh, uh, two streams. Yeah, a personal interest of mine is is brain and dementia. I, I, I do love to work with that. Um, we love to work with that, Dr. Quo in my office as well. Um, we've actually. I, are you familiar with the Bredesen protocol? Is yes. That, yeah. Explain it to some of the listeners. Yeah, so Dr. Dale Bresden, um, he's he's a neurologist over at UCLA. He's been, um, and for years now, he's really, he didn't start out as a functional medicine doctor, I don't think, um, but he kind of started, he, he kind of tripped into the fact that following functional medicine principles were, seemed to get much better uh, improvements in his Alzheimer's patients. And so, He's just, he, he released, I don't, apparently I might have dementia. I don't remember the name of his book, but he released it, I want to say last August, 2017 or thereabouts. And um, he's going on a big kind of national tour and has trained a number of healthcare practitioners now to walk people through the Bredis and protocol. So we actually work with one of them, Donna Sider. I, she's somewhere in the Pasadena-ish area. Mm -hmm. And she works, she's their, their Bredesen protocol um, coach, I guess. And so 
but she does need to get all the the neuroimaging and the blood work she needs to be able to work with a doctor. So that's where we come in handy, and we we have additional things that we can offer for these individuals. But the basic principles, and I'll probably forget one because I don't have it in front of me, but. He really divides people into, I think it was a seven categories originally, but now he calls it maybe five categories. And it's one is inflammation, one is sugar, so kind of to sugar toxic, one's inflammation toxic, one's toxin toxic, so the toxins in our environments like a heavy metal sort. Um, one's just kind of vascular insufficiency. So if there's been hardening of the arteries or whatnot. And then the other one is actually uh, the dazed and confused one where there's been traumatic brain injury, right? Again, from a car accident or sports um, often. Um, maybe you tripped and fell and hit your head. And that could have been a long time ago or recently, that's something a lot of people, I think, especially the lay person, most practitioners still, I think if, if it didn't happen in the past couple of days or couple of weeks, it's not an issue. Well, right. that's totally false, not true for the most part. And so he divides them into those categories and anybody can be a combination of one or any of those. And most people are a combination of three or four of those categories. But again, kind of like we were talking about earlier, it's which one is the, the one you go after or what is, the, what is the top one or two areas? Meaning, do you go after inflammation or are you going to go after toxins or are you going to go after blood sugar? And so it, it, I like the way he's done it. it ultimately, it's, it's, I've been practicing the Bredesen protocol before I ever knew about the Bredesen protocol because it's, it's, it's simply following the functional medicine principles, but he's put it into a very workable situation very, very wonderfully. And there's a lot of great um, literature on the hippocampus as it relates to dementia. I just kind of highlighted the main things that you can do to help the hippocampus again exercise um, make sure you're getting oxygenated well so a lot of people have obstructive sleep apnea um, that's got to be dealt with there's also a great book patrick McEwen, oxygen advantage on um, helps people breathe and oxygenate properly um, mouth taping i'm a big fan of that mm -hmm. uh, and uh, meditation also is part of his program the med i believe they go with the mediterranean diet maybe it's the paleo diet but diet is in there um, omega-3s are in there um, neurofeedback is not in there but in my opinion it should be in there uh, yeah yeah and that's so i looked it up for you and it's the end of alzheimer's uh by yes. dale bredesen and so and that's useful too because again it helps us to kind of create some some working categories to um, see if our patient is complaining of some earlier dementia or they're just not functioning to the level they need to be. Um, you know, the gut is, seems to have a role in at least two or three of, out of the five, um, whether it's from an inflammatory perspective or from a nutritional perspective. So, um, and with blood sugar, right, that's a whole other level that we can discuss. But um, that's, I mean, it, so let's, as we, the takeaways, like what, what can we do tomorrow? that to start to make a change, it doesn't matter what area that we're in, if we're psychologically focused, uh, structurally focused, or, or chemically focused, um, what can we take from this and, uh, and apply right away? Um, <laughs> we didn't even talk about this so much, but just look at the person. So we talked about posture and gait. Um, look if they have a muffin top. Look, do they see, S Y C test. Can you see your crotch test? Okay, I, I love that one because it, it. What does that mean? <laughs> so if someone, so I usually use this for males because um, males are more vulgar. But usually it's the C S Y P test. Can you see your penis? Right. I see. So when they're looking down, can they see past their? They look straight down. Can they see past their gut? Their okay. belt, right? Um, because. If there's, if there's excess abdominal fat, your gut is not healthy and mm. your brain is not healthy. Your brain is leaky and your gut is leaky. Mm. Um, and then, you know, those questions we asked before, um, you know, just ask the person, how is your diet? Right. And how is your poop? Yeah. 
are you moving? Do you have some movement routine? The best type is the kind you're going to do. Mm -hmm. All right. It, this doesn't have to be, you don't have to know the perfect exercise routine. You don't have to know the perfect diet. You don't have to know these things, but you do have to ask these things, these questions, and you have to pay attention. Just look at them. And I also highly recommend asking people their, I'm going to go a little bit more into the psychological aspect because I think it's so underappreciated by everyone outside of psychologists and the like and that's asking people their purpose mm -hmm. if they have a purpose in life asking are they happy and asking are they optimistic mm -hmm. and asking about their social um, structure do they have friends or family who uplift them not just friends or family <laughs> that can be a, a disaster <laughs> the wrong type or the wrong crowd but those are so underappreciated, you know, your uh, purpose in life. It, it's so, it's so interesting when I started asking people and I realized how few people have that mm -hmm. because these are having a purpose um, and it doesn't have to be profound. It can be, I want to play with my grandchildren. Like that's a purpose. That's a noble purpose. Or I want to be the, uh, a, a fantastic homemaker we don't have to have these, I'm going to save the world type of purposes. It's just a simple purpose. Um, I mean, talk about psychology and how that can affect the gut. Um, optimism, there's a number of studies on how much longer you live when you're optimistic versus pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And are you happy? I mean, how, how easy is it to ask somebody, hey, are you happy? No, are you really happy in life? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that you have to go down that rabbit hole, but it at the very least, you can spend 30 seconds on it and say, hey, I have someone who I'd like to refer you to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But being aware of just these real simple things, I think oftentimes as practitioners, we get so focused and caught up in what their main complaint is and why are they exactly here. But we, we, if we just take a small step back, spend a total of like, 90 seconds looking at them and asking these few questions we can and then either dealing with it ourselves or referring out we're going to be helping the patient or the client so much more profoundly than anything we can do on our own yeah that's so well said so well said dr yoshi thank you for that and again the hope is that as a community here in pasadena um, we have relationships and resources to support our patients and our clients so that we can um, ultimately um, help them reach the, their, their own goals. That's exciting. Yeah. Let's do it together. Do it. Thank you again for joining us. And we'll be uh, attaching, including uh, as many references as we can on what we've mentioned here and as well as some links to Dr. Yoshi and uh, the cool things he's doing. So thanks again. Thank you so much for listening to today's webinar. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future webinars, please contact us at pasadenaintoprofessional at gmail.com.